Attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the online public forum in AWARE webinar, ACICS webinar announcing, relating, and explaining the January and February 2014 Memorandum to the Field. Today's presenters are Dr. Albert C. Gray, President and CEO, Mr. Anthony Vita, Vice President of External Affairs, Ms. Susan Greer, Associate Vice President of Operations, and Ms. Teron King, Senior Manager of Policy and Institutional Review. The agenda for today's webinar will be as follows. We'll start with a welcome from our President and CEO, discussion of the 2014 ACICS Professional Development Conference. The first topic will include proposed changes to the accreditation criteria. The second topic will discuss final changes to the accreditation criteria. And the third topic will discuss placement verification program. And we will end with questions and comments. I will now turn it over to Dr. Gray. Good afternoon. Welcome to our AWARE webinar. We're broadcasting to you live today from atop the American Psychological Association building in Studio B1. We're genuinely thankful for your interest and engagement. Um, we continuously try to inform all of our members on ACS, ACICS um, activities and improvements, and we certainly hope this um, this AWARE webinar continues in that tradition and helps you uh, in that way. We're all partners in the delivery of the highest quality of education to our students, many of whom are non-traditional students and require the flexibility and career focus that only your institutions provide. So once again, welcome. And back to Tehran. Sorry, I'm still on. And that's because the next item on the agenda is our commercial. Uh, we just want to plug our professional development conference. We have an excellent professional development conference planned for November 3rd and 4th of this year, and we'll be in New Orleans, Louisiana, at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, the, con the conference promises to feature key speakers and presenters and the popular awards luncheon, and following the conference, as we always do, we'll be having our annual meeting. Registration will open on May 5th, so watch for that, and we look forward to seeing you at the um, Ritz-Carlton in New Orleans on November 3rd. And now I think it's back to Toronto. Thank you. Just quickly wanted to um, alert you to where you can find the memorandum to the field if you're not aware. Uh, you can go to our website, www.acics.org. Um, click on Council Actions, and then click on Memorandum to the Field. And the two memos that we will be discussing today are the January and February 2014 Memo to the Field. So we'll start with our proposed revisions to the criteria, which will cover the following areas, change of ownership, process, self-study submission, general education requirements, study abroad activities, cumulative grade point averages for graduate programs. And I will now turn it over to Ms. Greer. To Ms. Greer. Welcome, everyone. So the very first um, revision proposed to our criteria for this memo to the field is the change of ownership. And you can find that on page 21 of the memo to the field if you'd like to see the exact language and what has been uh, struck and what has been added. But this requirement is um, in order to bring us in alignment with the department's substantive change regulations. It, uh, in the change of ownership, we used to have a temporary reinstatement um, feature. We are now within the 30-day period of a change of ownership actually um, completing the entire process and reinstating the accreditation 
with council's approval. Uh, the schools will still be required to host a quality assurance monitoring visit within six months. And the other um, requirements with respect to attending our workshop are the same as they were in the past. The next um, proposed revision is the self-study submission. This one you can find on page 22 of the uh, memo to the field. And those of you that have uh, been with us for a while and at one point renewed your grant accreditation are familiar with our self-study process. We did change the date for submitting the self-study. So it's important now to turn your clock back 30 days. We did have this requirement on October 30th of the year prior to your grant accreditation. It is now September 30th. And those of you that submit CARS probably understand why we changed that um, submission date for you to have to submit a self-study and submit your CAR all within the one-day period was a little challenging last year. We also included in this um, revision to our criteria some um, additional requirements with respect to institutions actually submitting a self-study. So we do expect this to be done prior to the institution's grant of accreditation expiring. If not, we do have some language that allows us to uh, be a little bit more proactive in ensuring that the institutions adhere to this regulation. Again, page 22 of the memo to the field. I will now throw it to uh, Teron. Thanks, Susan. The next area of provo proposed revisions um, is covered dealing with the general education requirements, um, specifically Chapter 3, uh, the introduction in Section 3-3-202. Um, at its February 2014 policy meeting, the Council voted to propose a change in the general education requirements for occupational associate degree programs. Um, and this was done to make uh, a clear dif differentiation between occupational associate's degree requirements and academic associate degree requirements. In the next section, um, dealing, still dealing with general education requirements proposal as far as revisions, um, also came out of the February um, policy meeting in the area of the glossary. The Council voted to propose language that strengthens the general education requirements by requiring that subject matter from the humanities, mathematics, and the sciences, and the social sciences be required. Um, please note that if this proposed change, proposed language is accepted, that a future effective date will be given at that time. And now I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Bita. Thank you, Teron. <clears throat> uh, for those of you that have not participated in the WARE webinar before, uh, or maybe are just coming in a little bit later, so the, the reference materials for our WARE webinar today are actually two documents. One is the January memo to the field, and the other is the February memo to the field, which was just distributed yesterday. So for point of reference of the study abroad, you want to be looking at the February memo to the field. It's available on our website if you didn't receive the link through the uh, email blast that went out late yesterday afternoon. Uh, in summary, uh, and I just want to cover this in summary, the proposed changes, these are proposed changes to the criteria related to study abroad and international um, education activities uh, are accomplished and proposed based on changes to a number of sections. First of all, Section 2-2507, International Partnership Agreements, will go away. You'll notice in the memo to the field that um, items A through K were inadvertently omitted. We apologize for that. But all of the narrative in 22507 plus the items A through K go away under these proposed changes. They will no longer be operative, nor will there be any section in the criteria points adopted by Council that relates specifically and calls out international partnership agreements. Um, secondly, uh, in terms of editorial 
uh, conforming amendments, no substantive changes, that is, uh, for Section 3-1-500, Educational Activities, you will see that we have now added editorial uh, section heads for faculty involvement, programs requiring certification or licensure, specialized and programmatically accredited programs, and then the only new language under that section is 3-1504 that mentions specifically study abroad activities and references the new Appendix J, which was the meat, the substance of the new guidance and requirements by the Council on um, international study and educational activities. And so really 3154, uh, as you'll see in the memo, uh, refers institutions that are interested in international education activities to Appendix J. Then in Appendix J, it's all new material. The Appendix J did not exist before. So it covers a lot of the ground that was covered previously in the international partnership agreements, but it adds a lot more specifics. It adds including a definition for study abroad. It includes um, additional information under the definitions of home and host institution. And it also includes um, 14 discrete requirements that the Council has decided on um, that institutions must comply with in order to have their international education activities covered under the ACICS grant of accreditation. Um, the opportunity, therefore, to comment on those report, proposed changes is now through, through the end of March. And based on the commentary and feedback that the Council receives uh, in the next 30 days or so, then they will go ahead at the April Council meeting, um, use that feedback from member institutions to inform their final decisions. Um, ratify these changes uh, as is or with modifications and set an effective date. So there's still a little work yet to be done and an effective date has not been established. That is the summary at this point. And in terms of the explanation, uh, just a, a few points. Number one, the new, the new appendix more fully describes and prescribes the requirements for all international activities. Uh, that's the primary intent. And then it reflects an expanding interest in international program, uh, program delivery by our member institutions. And all the other changes that I have mentioned are conforming and editorial in nature. Thank you, John. Thanks, Tony. Um, next, we have our last um, and final proposed revision dealing with the cumulative grade point average for graduate programs. Um, if you remember, in April of 2013, the Council voted to add a 3.0 cumulative grade point average requirement for graduate programs. Through further discussion of this topic in February 2014, the Council voted to propose language which allows for the use of specified competencies and licensure or certification in approved professional graduate programs. And next we will have our final changes to the criteria, and I will turn this back over to Susan. So the one final, that is uh, being mentioned in today's webinar, is the changes that we made to Chapter 2, Title 2, Chapter 2, the institutional changes. Uh, these had to do with the substantive changes to our programs, uh, applications, and processes. It is also important to note that this was a very extensive change in our criteria. Several subsections and sections were renumbered. So just because you might have remembered 2-2-500, you're going to have to um, change your memory and go back in and look at the different sections and the different uh, areas that our criteria now reference because of uh, this substantive change. Thank you, Tron. Next, Next, we will cover our final topic, uh, the Placement Verification Program, which is PVP for short, and I will turn this over to Dr. Gray. Thank you, Tron. 
most of you, if not all of you, have been receiving information about our placement verification program work uh, over the past few months. We've sent out um, mailings and um, information via email to you uh, to, to introduce you to the concept and to give you some idea of what our progress and direction are. And uh, at this point, uh, I'd just like to update you a bit uh, on this program. Uh, a logical question I think that we continue to have to confront and should be able to answer is why do we need or have a placement verification program? Well, one simple reason is that placement is a major, if not the major, student achievement outcome that we use as a measure of quality assurance for our member institutions. And it's under continuous and ever increasing scrutiny. In fact, as many of you probably uh, saw, as late as yesterday, uh, there was a media report questioning the veracity of placement information at three uh, institutions and discussing how placement was defined and determined by those institutions. All three of them happened to be ACICS institutions, so place, ACICS accredited institutions. So placement continues to be an area of controversy, an area of scrutiny, and frankly has been an area where uh, credibility of reporting continues to be questioned. So one reason for a placement verification program is to shore up the credibility and the um, reliability uh, for both you know, all of the stakeholders uh, who um, depend on those, on those numbers for uh, making decisions. A second. Uh, reason is to increase um, the quality assurance that you as our member institutions and others uh, can point to uh, for this particular student achievement outcome. And finally, um, uh, a good solid placement uh, verification program will provide a stronger information basis for our council to make accreditation decisions. And that's a very important uh, consideration as well. Well, where are we at this point? Uh, in January, as I mentioned, we have been sending out letters to the membership in which we indicated um, what data requirements would be uh, associated with the placement verification program, data requirements from our institutions. Uh, in one case, there's a student attestation provision related to one of the definitions of, of placement, uh, and there's an attestation form attached to that. We sent out a sample attestation form and also some instructions related to attestation. I, you know, I would say at this time, though, and caution you that we're sending you information, uh, but this process and this program is not in effect. The effective date of this program, uh, as currently planned, is July 1, 2014. So don't take anything we send out right now to the bank as final. It's always possible uh, that there will be some revisions as the council meets in April and as our advisory committee uh, meets um, in the next few months and we continue to refine and improve uh, this, this process to assure its veracity and its usefulness as well as its, as well as its usability um, in connection with our member institutions. Now uh, we also had an alpha test in January and the alpha test was completed uh, and the purpose of that alpha test was using uh, volunteers from an advisory committee to test some of the scripts and some of the uh, actual uh, ac uh, activities that would be used by a call center in the verification process and to see where some of the um, problems might uh, be encountered in doing that. So we did complete an alpha test. In February, we planned to have an AWARE webinar to describe our progress and discuss it with you. And wow, we're on target because this is February for a few more days at least, and you are participating in that AWARE webinar. Now in March we're going to be going through a statistical evaluation to establish membership uh, measurement requirements. Remember this is a quality assurance process, it is not a compliance auditing process. The purpose is to provide better credibility for placement data through sound quality assurance placement verification processes. That requires us to do a certain amount of sampling and that sampling will be based on some statistical evaluations so that we can defend 
the sampling protocol based on good science. And uh, we'll be conducting that uh, during March. And that statistical analysis and study will also enable us to, um, to um, uh, define the size of the beta test that, um, that we'll be using, again, to test our process. And then in April, we will be going ahead with a certain number of institutions and, um, and going ahead establishing the parameters of a beta test and designing a beta test, which we will conduct through April and into May, and then in May implement and analyze the uh, information we obtain through the beta testing process and make the refinements and revisions in our, in our placement verification program procedures um, as needed. In June, then, we will have the final procedures defined, the system will be designed, and we will be communicating to you, our members, in written as well as in workshops and re uh, webinar format, those final procedures for your uh, information, preparing to enact those then uh, as we go live, as they say, with this process in July. Now, of course, July will be the effective date for the placement data and the data collection. However, we, are, we would not be actually having data reported to us by you uh, until August or September and, they're, they're go and going forward from there because uh, we will be looking at data from previous months. So that, uh, that is where we are at the moment. We are on schedule um, with this process. Uh, it is, as, as you might suspect, uh, a devil in the details process as you get into actually de determining how we can collect the data most effectively, how we can inter interface with our members so that the data collection is not excessively burdensome and so that the data we collect in, in is utilized and is meaningful. Uh, it requires some, some diligent effort on our part, but we are making progress and I think we'll have uh, uh, be sticking to the uh, timetable that I just outlined for you going forward. Now let me talk a little bit about the uh, actual design points of the study. As I mentioned, we are going to be using random sampling of institutions. So that means we'll be selecting certain institutions and be asking for stu uh, you know, your uh, placement data from those institutions. Um, we will be basing our verification mainly on student um, feedback and student contacts. That's not to say there will be no employer contacts. The extent and nature of those employer contacts is dependent somewhat on the success and depth of the information obtained from the student-based contacts. So, so it's something we'll be determining as we go along, but our, our process at this point in our design is based primarily on student contacts. And we will be communicating with schools during the process on the outcome of these contacts, which will be mainly through a call center. Um, and um, we'll be looking at discrepancies between placement data and call center results. And we'll work with the institutions on discrepancy resolution so that we get final uh, verified results um, going through the process. It's important to note that um, you know this is a sampling process and that we are going to be working with the schools as we go through the process, and it will definitely be a two-way communication effort uh, as we work uh, closely with you in that regard. There's another slide. You will, uh, the institutions will be required to uh, utilize the uh, currently um, employed ACICS definition for classifying placements. Uh, which uh, you know was effective last, I guess, last July, uh, as our new uh, definition of placement. That's in our criteria, or is it in our criteria? Or uh, yeah, it, it has been communicated, and uh, you know it, it's uh, placement by title, placement by skills, or placement by um, being employed in a position for which um, the student's program. Uh, helps uh, advance their career in that position. There are those three areas of placement classification. The, the, uh, the, the latter requires student attestations, so you'll be required and there will be a form to document student attestations. And uh, then 
basically when we ask for backup data, which is data you have previously been uh, instructed both uh, in nature and format uh, to, um, to collect, we will be expected, uh, expecting that data to be provided to us. Next. That's all I, I have for you right now in uh, placement verifications, but um, you know, as always, any questions you have, you can direct them directly to me by email. We have some time set aside in this webinar to entertain questions during the webinar. Uh, and we do also have a, um, a placement verification program um, website, or not website, email address that, um, that you can, and I don't, I don't see it on this slide, but that you can access. Yeah, we'll, we'll make that uh, email address available to you. It's basically a folder we have here to receive questions, comments, and concerns about the uh, placement verification program. Uh, and it's monitored by Conor O'Malley, who uh, is working on this program in-house.